අලුතෙන් SLT Mobitel Home 4G LTE connection ගන්න අයට වටිනා ටැබ් computer සහ data දීමන. අලුතෙන් SLT Mobitel Home 4G LTE connection ගන්න අයට වටිනා ටැබ් computer සහ data දීමන. Best ever sunlight. Then rupial 200ක best ever milakata. Tonight, upping the ante, the value-added tax amendment bill is passed in Parliament, increasing VAT on financial services from 15% to 18%. Shortage solutions. The central bank lifts its ban on foreign exchange transactions, allowing forward sales between parties. Tough choices. Economic Advisory Council member says Sri Lanka needs to get out of its subsidy addiction. Can we ask our forces to go home? We can't. So those are things that we can't do overnight. But someone must have the guts and the courage to do it. If you don't do it, there's a lot of sustainability. Come together. The United National Party calls for all party support for the drafting of a national policy. The UNP has a clear message. The country, the political parties and civil groups need to come together. We need to put aside our differences and form a national policy. All this and much more coming up on 1st at 9, this Thursday, the 24th of March, 2022. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana 1st at 9. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Bringing you the latest news from across the island and the world, this is First at Nine. I'm David Ebert. With the government moving to get assistance from the International Monetary Fund for the restructuring of the country's national debt, State Minister for Regional Cooperation Tarka Balusuria says that Sri Lanka will be a viable country for investments once macroeconomic fundamentals are put back in order after this. Speaking at a media briefing today, he also hinted at potential investments from Saudi Arabia into the country's renewable energy sector very soon. A government media briefing was held in Colombo today, where the subject was the country's current economic situation. This also touched on the subject of the government's decision to reach out to the International Monetary Fund on possible debt restructuring, which Health Minister K.D. Rambukwela says will have to be considered after the IMF's final report on Sri Lanka is received. Also speaking at the briefing was State Minister of Regional Cooperation, Tarka Balusuria, who revealed that the United States has offered to place its weight behind any IMF negotiations. Once we have the final report, it will be brought before the Parliament for everybody to know what uh, the terms and conditions that we have laid down and what we have agreed and what we discuss, what we disagree and then what we negotiate. And uh, that is how the IMF works, try to find a compromise. The key issue pertaining to our debt is the ISBs. We want to have a chat with the IMF and to see how best we can restructure the debt, thereby giving us a little bit of breathing space. And I'm certain that the uh, negotiations with IMF will be very conducive and the uh, United States also including uh, Ambassador Nuland stated that you know if there's any help in that regard they will also be more than willing to uh, intervene. So I think uh, once we get our macroeconomic fundamentals in order I believe that uh, Sri Lanka will be a very much a viable place for investments. Speaking further State Minister Baro Surya also hinted at possible investments in the renewable energy sector from the Middle East. I was in Saudi during the last two days. We had a very successful uh, meeting with the Minister of Investment and the State Minister of Foreign Affairs. We believe that a large Saudi investment will be coming to Sri Lanka within the next six months in the renewable area. And we feel that if that investment works out, there will be opportunity for ample investments from the Middle East. So it's not investments only from China. It's not investments only from Europe. It's not investments only from the United States. It's also investments from other countries such as the Middle East, including the Saudi Arabia. After being passed by the Committee on Public Finance earlier, amendments to the Value Added Tax Act No. 14 of 2002 were subsequently passed in Parliament today. With that, Value Added Tax on Financial Services will increase to 18% with effect from the 1st of January 2022. The Committee on Public Finance has passed the amendments to the Value Added Tax Act No. 14 of 2002 when it convened at the Parliament complex earlier this week. Accordingly, value-added tax on the provision of financial services will be increased from 15% to 18% with effect from the 1st of January 2022. 
In addition, this amendment will provide for the exemption of VAT only on medical equipment, machinery and pharmaceutical donations made to government hospitals and the Ministry of Health in the event of any epidemic or public emergency. The Committee on Public Finance has also approved an agreement between the governments of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka and the Republic of Turkey that will help the two nations avoid double taxation and prevent tax evasion with respect to income taxes. The Advisory Committee appointed to assist the National Economic Council earlier this week in a meeting with the President presented five recommendations for immediate implementation. Key among the suggestions was the appointment of a financial advisor immediately and a legal advisor to walk the government through its debt restructuring talks with the IMF. Meanwhile, speaking to Indivar Yamuatta on our current affairs program at Hyde Park this evening, Advisory Council member Duminda Hulangamu also suggested that the country take a serious look at public sector reforms as well. Member of the Advisory Committee to the National Economic Council, Duminda Hulangamu says that Sri Lanka needs some serious soul-searching on whether it is prepared to continue shouldering the burden of loss-making state-owned enterprises. He added, however, that whatever solutions are proposed to the problem will have to be socially and politically sustainable, which is a bit of a double-edged sword for any government prepared to consider taking them. Here we're talking about handouts, uh, an economy with a handout culture. Your expertise in tax also. We'd like to hear from you. What is the way forward now? So in the the measures that we recommend also can't be looked at isolation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, best in class proposal we can make. At the same time, you also have to make sure that it's sustainable in terms of society. For example, we have a fiscal deficit. In order to bridge that deficit, the easiest is to increase taxes or cut down government expenditure. Those are the two that you can do. Now, if you look at the increasing of taxes, we have to first see how many can afford to pay tax. Now, of our revenue collection, about 70 to 80 percent still come from direct taxes. That is from VAT, uh, customs taxes, etc., which have come down significantly now because of the economic situation. If you increase taxes, it's a burden on the people. So the question is how much you can burden the people, especially the current situation. Secondly, with regard to government expenditure, about 70 to 80 percent of the revenue collection goes to pay salaries of government servants. That is recurrent expenditure. The SOEs that are a burden on the treasury. We all know as the electricity board is selling at subsidized prices. The petroleum corporation is still, even at these prices, are making losses. Uh, railways making losses. Can we just sell them off or can we make the market base overnight? No, I don't think you can do it. Politically, yes, you can't do it. I have worked with most governments in power on these matters and all have a political, uh, so they can't just retrench 3,000, 4,000 people, they can't close government departments, defense expenses 15 percent more, can we ask the armed forces to go home, we can't. So those are things that we can't do overnight. But someone must have the guts and the courage to do it. If you don't do it, there is a long to sustainability. So at some point, we have come too far in my view in terms of not doing the structural reforms. Because if you don't do the structural reforms, whatever adjustments you make on the fiscal policy side also, the economy will not develop because we are continuing to fund loss-making activities loss-making ventures. So these are easy said and done. I mean, all of us can come and talk here, but it's not easy to implement. Hulangamo added that Sri Lanka also needs to wean itself off from its subsidy addiction. However, the problem remains how that can be achieved without leading to social unrest. Long-term sustainability requires a higher tax to GDP, which we need to increase from where we are now. We used to about 18% we used to be, now we are down to about 9%. We need to get at least 12%. How to go government expenditure? So we have to rationalize our government expenditure, which is not easy. Then how do you remove subsidies, as you said? Electricity board, petroleum corporation. Or what? So are we going to have a program to do subsidies? Are we going to have a market-based economy? Then is there, will there be social unrest? Right? We have to manage that as well. No point having uh, everything beautifully planned and implemented if you have social unrest. Mm. Right? People on the streets. So but at we, some point, we need to take those unpopular uh, decisions too. We have to take unpopular decisions. But uh, political unpopularities are okay, so long as there's no social, social unrest. So, so it's a real challenge we are facing as Sri Lanka at the moment. So we need to take bold decisions at least one by one, step at it. I don't think you can do everything overnight, but at least few things we can start are doing now itself and and I think publicity reform has to happen someone must have the courage to do it meanwhile United National Party working committee member Dinu Kolombage has called for all political parties and civil society groups to shed politics and help draft a permanent national policy that will help the country deal with the current economic crisis yesterday afternoon representing the United National Party our leader and former Prime Minister Mr. Rani Wickremesinghe attended the all-party conference. We attended that with the sole purpose of presenting some ideas on how we can solve the crisis in the country. Now at that meeting, there are a few key points that we were, that the UNP raised. One of those was 
that we have to engage the IMF. Now, the government has said that they are going to engage the IMF, and we thank them for that. However, this demand has been made since April 2020, at the onset of the COVID pandemic. The government ign has ignored it for two years, which has resulted in this crisis going. So now, at least if the government is engaging the IMF, we have said they need to go one step further. We are going in for a debt restructuring program, which means that we are going to need the assistance of experts. In Sri Lanka's case, there has never been a debt restructuring program undertaken by any government. This means that that expertise is not within the country. So we have said they need to go outside and in a transparent manner with a commonly agreed upon criteria, we have to select experts who will come in and guide the government on how to undertake this debt restructuring program. Before any of these solutions are taken, the UNP has a clear message. The country, the political parties and civil groups need to come together. We need to put aside our differences and form a national policy. Now by a national policy, we are, we are saying that the government and the country needs to implement a new framework by which future governments will operate. We need to have a commonly agreed upon direction in which the country will go down. 1977, when the then president, J.R. Jayawardena, took office, he introduced a new national policy that saw the opening of the economy and the growth of the middle class. However, in the 45 years since, there has been no progress in terms of a national policy. Successive governments have come and reversed the decisions and initiatives undertaken by the previous government. That is why we are now facing the problems we face today. So we are calling upon all political parties and all civil groups to put aside your differences and come together. We need a national policy if we want to have long-term solutions to the problems in the country. The UNP can take over tomorrow. We can solve this crisis. Unfortunately, that when the next government comes in without the structure of a national policy, those problems will once again arise because most likely they will reverse many of the decisions that we take. In the meantime, the Court of Appeal has issued a notice stating that a circular issued in December last year requiring foreigners wanting to marry locals to apply for a defence clearance report as a precondition to register their marriage as being in contravention of the Marriage Ordinance Act. The Court of Appeal has issued a notice stating that a circular issued in December last year requiring clearance from the Ministry of Defence for marriages between foreigners and Sri Lankan nationals is in contravention of Section 7 and 32 of the Marriage Registration Ordinance and is not in line with Sections 23 and 24 of the said ordinance. The writ application was filed against the Registrar General, the Secretary to the Ministry of Defence and the Secretary to the Ministry of Health. The circular which was issued through the Ministry of Defence stated that foreigners who intend to marry Sri Lankans would have to apply for a defence clearance report as a precondition to register their marriages in terms of the Marriage Registration Ordinance of 1907. It also detailed that they would have to submit a health declaration form which includes declaring any medical conditions such as chronic kidney disease, cancer, filaria, hepatitis C and B, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis or any other health concern that requires medical attention. In addition, a certificate issued within the last six months by the home country of the foreigner indicating that the foreigner has not been convicted of any crimes was also required. And we'll be back with more local news right after this break. Big Three. Welcome back. Chairperson of the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority, Kimali Fernando, has briefed President Gotabe Rajapaksa of a significant increase in hotel room registrations of up to 58% during the COVID-19 period. During the visit of the President to the SLTDA, she also explained that this was only possible after certain unfair rules were relaxed in a bid to register more rooms. This has led to the registration of over 90,000 hotel rooms since then. President Gotabe Rajapaksa visited the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority in Kolpiti today. Registration, 
Fares of intercity and special train services on the upcountry line and the northern line have been increased. According to the general manager of Sri Lanka Railways, the revision in the fares came into effect from midnight yesterday. A notice issued by the railway's general manager noted that fares of intercity and special trains to Al railway station were also amended. The decision came following an approval received by the Transport Minister Dilum Amanugama to increase train fares at a cabinet meeting earlier this month. More information on the hike train fares can be found on our website www.adaderna.lk. Meanwhile, the Public Utilities Commission has approved the request of the Ceylon Electricity Board to implement a scheduled power cuts tomorrow. Accordingly, the areas under the groups P, Q, R, S, T, U, V and W will experience power cuts of 4 hours and 30 minutes between 8.30 am and 5.30 pm and 1 hour and 15 minutes between 5.30 pm and 11 pm. Meanwhile, areas under the groups A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K and L will be imposed power cuts of 3 hours and 20 minutes between 8 am and 6 pm and 1 hour and 40 minutes between 6 pm and 11 pm. Two Indian trawlers with 16 Indian fishermen have been arrested while poaching in Sri Lankan waters during separate patrols carried out by the Sri Lankan Navy. Considering the impact of foreign fishermen poaching in Sri Lankan waters and threats that have been made to the biodiversity of the country's marine environment, regular patrols and operations have been conducted by the Sri Lankan Navy. Accordingly, the seizures were made during patrols carried out by the fast attack craft of the 4th Fast Attack Flotilla in Sri Lankan waters, northwest of the islands of Delft in Jaffna and Iranathivu in Mana. The Navy took hold of the two Indian trawlers with 16 Indian fishermen while they were engaged in bottom trawling in the island's waters. The Navy also seized the stock of fish caught illegally through this fishing method. Meanwhile, arrangements are being made to hand over the Indian poaching vessels and fishermen to the relevant authorities. The Sri Lanka Customs has detected 350 kilograms of cocaine concealed among scrap iron in a transshipment container originating from Panama and bound for India. A total, a total of four containers declared as scrap iron have been shipped from the origin country of Panama to Belgium and then to Dubai before arriving in Sri Lanka while they were expected to be shipped to India. However, the shipment was stopped and searched in Sri Lanka by the Port Control Unit which has the authority to shop transshipment containers suspected of smuggling narcotics. Following the inspection, around 350 kilograms of cocaine was discovered inside one of the four containers. The street value of the cocaine haul has been estimated at around 6 billion rupees. Now, atmospheric conditions are favourable towards the forming of thunder showers during the next few days, the Department of Meteorology says. Showers or thunder showers are expected to occur at several places in, <coughs> in the north, north central, eastern, central, Sabargamwa and Uwa provinces after 2 p.m. Meanwhile, the general public has been advised to take adequate precautions to minimize damage caused by temporary localized strong winds and lightning during thunder showers. Further, the Met Department has also predicted mainly fair weather over the sea areas around the island. Meanwhile, the sea areas off the coast extending from Kanke Santure to Mana and Hambantura to Potoville will be fairly rough at times it warned. Winds are expected to be westerly to southwesterly with speeds between 20 to 30 km per hour. Wind speeds can also increase up to 40 km per hour at times in the sea areas off the coast extending from Kanke Santure to Putalam via Mana and Hambantura to Potoville. Meanwhile, a fire that erupted at a house in Katugastra in Kandy has killed three people and left one injured. According to the injured victim, the fire had been started as revenge by a former fiancé of another of the victims. A fire broke out at a house located in the area of Manik Kumruvatta in Katugastra at around 6 a.m. this morning. Of the four residents in the house when the fire erupted, three were reported dead during the incident. Further, the residence was completely destroyed by the fire. 
The victims of the incident were 30-year-old Iswara Devan Chandravani, her father Muttambi Iswara Devan, and another person suspected to be the ex-fiancé of the 30-year-old. The mother of the 30-year-old victim who was injured in the incident was taken to the general hospital in Kandy. By recording a statement with the police, she alleged that the fire had been started by the former fiancé of her daughter, with whom she had a 12-year relationship. She added that the former fiancé had also threatened them after visiting the house last evening as well. She claimed that her daughter was getting ready for her marriage to another person, which led him to take such action. The central bank has lifted a ban on foreign exchange transactions and allowed banks to provide forward sale and purchase of foreign exchange facilities to importers. This new direction is expected to play a role in ending shortages of goods in the country. On the 25th of April 2021, the central bank prevented commercial banks from selling dollars to customers for future transactions, causing significant issues for importers who found it difficult to order goods from abroad. This move comes in the wake of a decision by the central bank to allow the Sri Lankan rupee to depreciate earlier this month. In the meantime, the Ministry of Finance and the central bank have assured the public and all stakeholders that the banking system in the country is stable and that the operations of the state banks are being carried out smoothly. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has written to the Minister of Health requesting to implement a pricing mechanism for medicines and medical devices. The Chamber highlights concerns brought to its attention by three leading healthcare associations regarding the lack of a pricing mechanism on pharmaceutical products and medical devices. They have raised concerns that the sharp depreci depreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee against the US dollar, together with increasing inflation due to local and global factors, the lack of an exchange rate sensitive pricing mechanism makes it difficult for the private sector to meet the public demand without incurring sizable losses in particular for items that are under price control. A CCC statement said the cost and availability of medicines and devices must be balanced if the industry is to provide the best and timely outcome to the most important stakeholder, the patients. In the absence of a rational, equitable and easy to implement pricing mechanism, the industry players are concerned about the continuous supply of products in the future. The CCC said it looks forward to a favourable and urgent response to the concerns by requesting that a meeting with industry players be granted by the Minister. The Sri Lanka Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, the Sri Lanka Chamber of Pharmaceutical Industry and the Sri Lanka Chamber of Medical Devices Industry, whose members supply about 80% of the products in the market, have jointly expressed this concern. Meanwhile, the State Minister for Production, Supply and Regulation of Pharmaceuticals, Professor Chandra Jayasumana, said recently that cabinet approval was obtained recently for a special mechanism to purchase pharmaceuticals from local manufacturers. He also said that a score system has been implemented for product quality under the new mechanism. In your market update, stocks ended in the red today, with the all share price index declining by 6.1 points to end at 10,451 points. The S&P SL20 index of more liquid stocks, however, ended in the green at 3,611 points, gaining 17.76 points. Market turnover was 17 was 1.7 billion rupees. Foreign purchases were, one, were 171 million rupees, while foreign sales were 22 million rupees. Foreign participation in market activity ended at subdued levels, with foreigners closing as net buyers. The capital goods sector was the top contributor to the market, while diversified financial sector came in a close second. In the meantime, crude prices fell today as the United States and its allies discussed a possible further coordinated release of oil from storage to help calm energy markets in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And with that, that's all the news we have for you today. We hope you join us at the same time tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>